for your grace to come to every single one of us in here. God, your people are wanted to hear you. Your people are thirsty of you. I'm asking your grace to come. Come, Lord Jesus. This is way beyond me, God. This is way bigger than me. I need your help, Lord God. Help me to open scriptures, to preach and teach well. And I'm asking that the Holy Spirit involve yourself in this. Apart from you, what I do is nothing, God. I need your help. I need your help. I need your help. Thank you so much, Father. We ask all this in the mighty name, the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. You may be seated. Very good morning, everybody. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Yeah, Christmas is such a such a big season that uh, even the non-Christians celebrate it, right? <laughs> uh, regarding this Christmas, it's it's a it's a huge time. So sometimes I confuse because every year we celebrate this, you know. And I was thinking, what should I preach on Christmas? So I do a little bit of digging throughout the church history. You know, what do people talk about in, on Christmas? What do people preach on Christmas? So on my research, I come out with a, with a word called Advent. The word Advent, <clears throat> it keeps showing up. People uh, throughout the church history, they, they keep preaching this on Christmas. Like on Christmas, they keep, they keep talking about Advent. They keep talking about... Uh, this Advent, this word keep coming up. So I was thinking, what is it? Sounds like important. So I do a little bit digging of research. What is this Advent mean? You know, and I found out that Advent is just mean the coming of Christ, right? Uh, have you heard uh, Adventist church? They got something to do with uh, Advent, uh, the coming of Christ. So I, I decided I'm gonna preach about Advent. Then. I'm trying to be faithful. Uh, there's a lot of people smarter, a lot of people more anointed than me. I just follow their step, right? <clears throat> so, Christmas, we celebrate Christmas is about Advent. It's about the coming of Christ. Now, the coming of Christ, there's two parts. Two part. Now, I'm going to try to explain both of them. The first Advent is this. <clears throat> Throughout the Old Testament, God he keep telling the people of Israel, keep telling his nation, put your hope on me. I'm going to send someone to deliver you. I'm going to send someone to help you. I'm, I'm going to have this servant and he's going to be the hero. All the problem in the world, you're supposed to put hope in this person. And throughout the Old Testament, God start giving clues. You know, that this person is going to be born in, in Bethlehem. This person is is going to be uh, a king forever. 
And God start giving a clues. God start telling his people um, uh, on the time when, when Israel was destroyed. God said, do not worry about Israel. There will be a restoration when this hero come, when this Messiah come. So the nation of Israel, they have this concept of a hero, of Messiah. Oh, God said there's, there's someone coming. There's a hero. There's a Messiah. When he comes, he gonna, he gonna fix everything. Right? So all the promises keep coming from God, keep coming from God. All the clues until the last book of the Old Testament, which is the book of Malachi. God said, yep, it's coming, coming very soon. And before the Messiah come, I'm going to send someone to, to go first before him, a messenger. They call, he will be called Elijah. And then if you look if in your Bible, in the last book of uh, test, uh, the Old Testament, is the book of Malachi. To go to the New Testament, it's only one or two pages, right? But in, 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 in actual time, it's 300 years. For just one flip, that's a 300 years different. Which means, during that 300 years, God is silent. See, God used to send a prophet. God to, used to, to give his words. But then, after the book of Malachi, silent. No more prophet. No more word of God. There's no more miracle. No, nothing. It's quiet. Then everybody start thinking, is, 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 is God, you know, is the Messiah really coming? Maybe, 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 you know, uh, God just gave us an empty promise. And some people arise up to the occasion, proclaim Messiah. Our people thought he was the Messiah. But actually it's wrong. Like Judas the Maccabee during that 300 years. And they start have this hope, ah, maybe, maybe that guy. But then that guy dead. Their, their hope is gone. So they've been waiting and waiting and waiting for 300 years. Nothing. Until one time, the angel shows up and he said, joy to the world. So all of a sudden, <clears throat> There's a, the, the, the hope of the people that longing for 300 years. They hear a word. An angel shows up. And that goes. I uh, say joy to the world. And then this, this, they start hearing the same promises. You know, peace will come into the world because this baby is born in Bethlehem. The first one to be invited is the, uh, the shepherd. And then... <clears throat> From then on, it's, it, it, it's silent again. Because Jesus just born, yeah, there's a lot of big thing happen. The, the three major, the, the, the wise men from the east came to give offering. Uh, the shepherd came and be a witness because the angels told them to go see this baby. But then after that, it's silent for around 30 years. Jesus just grew and do what normal people does. He grew. He helped his father, he goes to school, until the ministry started. All of a sudden, before Jesus started his ministry, there's this Elijah shows up, named John the Baptist. He started doing ministry, he started baptizing people, until he baptized Jesus. And when Jesus got baptized, all of a sudden, it revealed. There's no more, you know, wondering, no more question mark. Is this the Messiah? It is, because God says it. When he got baptized, God said, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. Now, that is the first advent, the first coming of Christ, where the people's hope are put on Jesus. The people's hope, they keep hanging on God's word. God said, Messiah is coming, and we see a Messiah, this Jesus. But the problem is, the work is not done. When Jesus arrived, when Jesus came into this world the first time, he gave this, um, or he just conquered this Satan, sin, and death. Right? He, he, he proved to everyone, I have conquered Satan, sin, and death. Now I'm giving you a way, I'm giving you freedom. You want to choose me, or you want to choose something else? Yeah. If you believe in me, your sin is forgiven, your fate is in my hand, trust me. That's what Jesus keeps saying. And after that, 
uh, we, we see the we see the proof that uh, Jesus got crucified, and then he come back three days later, and then after that he was ascended to heaven. Now before he ascended to heaven, he keep talking about the future. The future he said, "I'm I'm gonna come back, and yeah, a lot of terrible things gonna happen, but I will be back. I'll be with you till the end of time." Jesus keep giving that promise. Now that is the second uh, advent, which is the coming of Christ, the second coming of Christ. Now, when, when, when I talk about the second coming of Christ, I, I ask the people, a lot of people in the church, in my church, in Newcastle, hey, what do you think about the second coming of uh, Jesus? And they all give me this response, oh, it's scary. Why? Yeah, there's Antichrist. There's, there's the, 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 the number of the beast. Oh, they, they all have this, this response for me, wondering, I'm, I'm, why are you scared, you know? Because when I look at the scripture, for example, if you open the book of Revelation, chapter 22, verse 20. The book of Revelation, chapter 22, verse 20. It says this. He who testified to these things says, Surely I am coming soon. And then it says, Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. John, when he hear, Jesus said, I am coming soon. John goes, Amen, Lord, come. Like he, he wants Jesus to come right away. It's so different response with, with, with my, my people in my church, in the church. They all get scared. They all, uh, it's, it's going to be a terrible time. It's, it's different response. And I look at another response uh, from uh, 1 Corinthians uh, 16. Uh, Paul's response regarding the, the second coming of Christ. 1 Corinthians 16. Chapter 16, verse 22. <clears throat> he says this if anyone has no love for the Lord let him be a curse our Lord come when he's uh, when he's finishing advising the church and then he says uh, if you don't love Jesus you will go to hell you will, there is curse upon you and then he says he said, our Lord come there is this angst in, in the people of the Bible that they want Jesus to come soon you know and I don't see them in, in, in our people in our days in our generation that that's what happened with the people because I ask them because it's scary because uh, uh, if Jesus come oh it's, it's bad things needs to happen so I was thinking that's 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 true I'm not saying that's not true I'm saying yeah it's true bad things need to happen because Jesus predicted but if you focus on what's gonna happen after Jesus arrived, it might give this hope in you that 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 you you can't wait you, the same hope that these people has. So I'm trying to to show you what is gonna happen when Jesus arrived. You know, because this is actually what all people want deep down inside their heart. Some people are fighting for freedom. Some people are fighting for peace. This is actually the one who can give us the real one. Not the peace that just exists for a few years and then it's chaos again. But this Jesus, he came to give all this what, what we're craving of. So I'm trying to, uh, to probably fix a little bit of bad teaching in the church. Because uh, sometimes uh, a, a good people, in well-intentioned people, they, they tell you, okay, this is what's supposed to happen. On the second coming of Christ, they give emphasis on that. They didn't give emphasis on what's going to happen after Jesus arrived. Because if you see what's going to happen, this thing won't matter. <clears throat> now, firstly, I'll do this. Uh, the purpose of the second coming of Christ. I need you to open the book of Hebrew, chapter nine. The book of Hebrew, chapter nine. 
Verse 28. <clears throat> Hebrew chapter 9, verse 28. This is what it says. So Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear the second time. It's a promise, right? He will appear a second time. Not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for Him. See, throughout the church, I keep getting this uh, victim mentality throughout the church. I, I keep hearing that, you know, uh, we, we've been losing in this world. Yeah, we, we've been persecuted. The, the, they, we've been killed. And we're losing the, the culture wars. The homosexual getting married now. We keep losing ground in the world. So they think uh, when Jesus come back, they're going to get it. Uh, when Jesus come back, they they gonna uh, Jesus gonna spank them. Basically, that's what they said, right? So uh, when I look at this text, you know, when when Jesus come back, he doesn't concern about them. He don't care because the, he says that the the the, the last uh, sentence says uh, when Jesus comes the second time, not to deal with sin because sin is already dealt in the cross. But he says, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. This is, this strikes something in my heart. Because I don't see that in me. I don't see that in God's people these days. See, when I, when I read this text, we said, who are eagerly waiting for him. I keep remembering my son. See, I'll tell this story. <clears throat> I'm trying to teach my son that, uh, you know, Christmas is connected with Christ. Because we're living in the, in, the, in the bad world, in the bad culture, where they try to separate, to divorce the word Christmas and Jesus. When you think about Christmas, they try to make you think, oh, it's about sale. Oh, the price will go down. It's about shopping. They try to teach that, right? Um, uh, and they keep trying to teach my son because my son keep watching this TV and then there's an ad it's a Christmas sale, there's a lot of toy so when I ask son, what do you think about Christmas? I get a new toy you will get a new toy but that's not the big, the big point okay? so I decided, you know, in order to teach him so we're going to open our Christmas when we're having the Christmas celebration at the church okay? so last time we have a celebration on uh, 30th of November so that's when we open present, the night after the, the Christmas celebration. That's when we open present. Then I want him to connect. Ah, oh, okay. We, we go to church. We celebrate Christmas first. And then we open the present. Okay. Now, I bought the present through three weeks before. I already told him, son, I've already have your present. And he said, where is it? I'm not going to tell you because you want to open it right now. I got to hide it. And every day he keeps asking me, Daddy, is it Christmas yet? No, son, not two weeks, not two weeks. No, oh, I want it now. You have to wait. Every day he keeps saying, Daddy, is it Christmas yet? No, son, no, wait, wait, no. He keeps asking and asking. And that's when I, when, when my, my mind goes, when, when I read the text, when, when uh, Jesus comes a second time not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for Him. Now, this is, since I, since I read this text, since I try to understand what it means, I start having this, this uh, I don't know, uh, habit. Every time I wake up from sleep, I keep thinking about Jesus. Hey, Jesus, is this today? You're going to come? Ah, I'm still awake. Ah, I'm still in my old self. I'm still fat, you know. When Jesus arrives, He will give us a new body. Everyone will look sexy. Everyone will look slim. Right? That's what I thought. But uh, every day, uh, not today, not today. So, when we read this text, it seems that Jesus, He got this, this desire in Him. Oh, I can't wait to see my people. And 
he get when he second time he comes, he doesn't care about the sinners. He doesn't care about all them because all that already dealt in the cross. You believe in the cross, there's forgiveness of sin. You don't believe in the call in the cross, you will be punished for your wrong sin. But then Jesus decided on the second coming, I want to get my people. Ah, oh, they've been waiting for me for years and years. I wanna, I wanna, I wanna, I wanna be with them. I wanna see them. I wanna show them I love them. And that's the heart of God on the second coming of Christ. We can't think that uh, when Jesus comes, He's gonna punish all the bad guys. You can't think like that. No, when Jesus comes, He's gonna get us all the one who wait for Him eager. Now, God said, "What happened after Jesus come?" And it says that uh, this is such a big deal. And yeah. that, if you have and your Bible, you shall be no more. To the book of Revelation. When the last time? Chapter Someone 21. you know. You know. Close. Die. You know how that fell? The book of Revelation. Last week, uh, I just had a, a funeral uh, in, 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 in my church. Uh, I can see the sting of death. The, the the family that's been abandoned by the husband. Oh, I can see it on, 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 on the wife. It's so it's it's so sad. And <clears throat> I'm glad for this text because it says that shall be no more. And it says, Neither shall there be mourning. You know how when I think about mourning, ah oh, it's, I'm thinking about this. Have you ever made a, a mistake that means you go, ah, I shouldn't go make that move. I shouldn't do this. I shouldn't do that. Like last time when, when, when we have a funeral, I tried to comfort the wife, right? Because uh, uh, my job, pastor, I should show up and try to comfort, try to ease the pain. And I keep stepping on landmines. I show up, hello, how are you? Yeah. I'm sorry for your loss, okay, and I tried to distract her from the hospital and go, hey, that's a good tea, that's a nice TV you have there. And she goes, yeah, that's right, my husband bought me that, then she cried. Oh, wrong move, okay. Ah, oh, you have a nice house here, there's a lot of things. And he goes, yeah, my husband bought me that, ah, oh, again. Like, he stepping on landmine, I go this way, she cried. I go that way, she cried. Keep mourning and mourning. No, there won't be any more of that. It says there's uh, there uh, there be no more mourning. There shall no 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 more mourning. No more mistakes. You you imagine that? There's no wrong mistakes. There's no ah should have do that. You know, like I preached this a uh, few few weeks ago <clears throat> on my church and on this illustration I used my wife. My wife. Uh, <laughs> One time he get angry at me. He he he, 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 he she uh, she tries to make a bread, right? He, she I like this about my wife. She she learned uh, a recipe from computer, and then now I'm gonna try to make that. You know I like it because I'm the one who's gonna try that, right? And there's one time my wife tried to make a bread, and you know in the bread when you make a bread it's supposed to uh, go well, I don't know what, more. Uh, Apa sih berkembang bahasa Indonesia-nya? Yeah, it, it's supposed to go there, and it doesn't work, and it's still it's still down the the bread, and she got upset at me. Why is my bread is like this? It's supposed to go up. It's supposed to go everywhere. I, I don't know. You made it. Why you get angry at me? You know, and uh, that's exactly what not gonna happen in the in the in the, in the world when Jesus shows up. There's no more mistake. There's no more mourning. There's no ah wrong. I, I make this wrong move. No, there's no mourning. And I ask, uh, let me ask you this personally: Have you ever sick and tired of your sin yet? You know, I'm tired of repenting. You know, wow. Every night, God keep reminding me, you've said the wrong stuff. Uh, you forgot to give encouragement to your son, or to your wife. It makes me mourn. God, I'm sorry, help me. Now I'm tired of that. You know, in heaven, there won't be any more of that. There won't be any more mourning. It's just going to be joy. And then it says, no crying. 
There won't be any crying, nor pain anymore. You know, when we're talking about pain, it's not just talking about physical pain. Someone hit you, it hurts, that's right. But if someone betrays you, the pain is in here. And God is saying, there won't be any more pain. No one's going to betray you. No, I'm, I'm going to make the world so beautiful that all these things that you experience, it's, you will talk like, like, a, like, like a veteran of war. You know, people that come out from the war, they talk, hey, remember back those days, you dodge a bullet, yeah, I hit it, look. We're going to talk about like that, like that in heaven. So, uh, how long you live? I live probably, what, 60 years? What do you got? Oh, I got cancer in here. Really? Oh, uh, thank God we're here now. Forget about it. There's no more cancer. And we will talk like that in heaven because all this, we're going to forget about this. All this that we live, that we face, probably, what, 80, 70, 100 years the most. But in heaven, we live for eternal. And God is saying, ah, uh, this is what's going to happen in my kingdom. There's no more pain, no more tears, no more cry, no more remorse. Isn't this what people say in this world? Only Jesus can provide. They didn't know. Only Jesus can provide this. <clears throat> and the best one, if you open the book of Zephaniah, the book of Zephaniah chapter 3, Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 17. <clears throat> the book of Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 17. That whole text, context, is talking about the restoration of Israel. Right? And it says this, when, when everything is restored, this is what's going to happen. It says, uh, Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 17. The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exalt over you with loud singing. Now, let me ask you this. You remember the last time you, you just filled with joy, you're so happy, you just explode by singing, dancing. I see this all the time with my son. My, when Saturday we went to my mom's house, uh, Christmas, my mom bought him a present. He started jiggling, yay, I got a present. He started feeling with joy, he started wiggling, he started dancing, you know. And for most of us, that's what we do when, you know, remember when you get a raise, or uh, when you have your first kid, you feel this joy in your heart, it's just, uh, it's just blow out. It's just, uh, I'm so happy. Let me buy you uh, food. You know, you just start buying people everything. Because you're so happy, you, you want to explode. That feeling. It says that God ha will have that feeling when everything's said and done. When, when all His people are gathered. When we are in heaven. When we're getting together. All of a sudden, God filled with this joy. And He decided, I'm going to sing. See? I don't care what song, what kind of type of music you are, because people have different type of music. Uh, I'm kind of jazz, I'm, I'm kind of rock, uh, I'm like dango, yeah. But when Jesus sings, everyone will like it. Right? And, and Jesus, the picture is God fell with this joy that makes his people, uh, I love you. This is what I made for, I made you for, to worship, let's get, let's, let's have this communion together. And that's the picture of heaven. I'm trying to make you understand. The concept of heaven is, it's about Jesus. If there's no Jesus, there's no heaven. Even if the place made with gold, with a lot of things, but if there's no Jesus there, it's not heaven. And this is what going to happen when Jesus is going to come on the second coming of Christ. <clears throat> now, 
to, to close this up, as a conclusion, if uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a prediction by Jesus of what's going to happen in the world on the end. And the prediction is this. It's on the book of Matthew chapter 13, verse 24 to 30. I'm not going to read it all. I'll give you the summary. Jesus gave this prediction that in the end of time, this is how it's going to go. So the book of Matthew chapter 13, verse 24 to 30. The end of time is just like a, a, far, a, a, a farmer sow a seed, right? A good seed on the ground. And then he goes to sleep. But then the enemy shows up, throw a bad seed. As they start growing, the farmer starts seeing, you know, how come there's a good seed and a bad seed on the, on the, on the ground, right? And the workers talk to the farmer, hey, uh, what should we do? Should we cut them? Start it over with, you know? And the farmer said, nah, let it grow. And then when, when it's time to get the result, then we, we cut them both and then we separate them. You know, the good one goes here, the bad one goes there, right? And that's the promise by Jesus. That, uh, but it's like that in the end of time. What, 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 what Jesus tried to say is this. The good city um, will grow and bring fruit. And also the bad seed will grow and bring fruit. And that's what we see in this world. Exactly what we see in the world. We see the bad seed grows darker and darker and darker. We see persecution. We see terrorists. We see rumors of wars. They bring fruit. That's true. Yes. Some people probably believe the Antichrist, the Antichrist start raising up. Maybe right. I'm not sure. But... It's true. The bad start giving proof. The bad, the, the, the bad seed is growing. But it's also the good seed. Have you noticed this? When I'm doing the, the church history, I'm studying, you know, a uh, few generation or last generation before us, there's no Christian in China. That country is closed. No religion whatsoever. Today, there's a lot of underground churches in China. Which means what? The good seed growing. And the same thing happened with the Arabs country. Few generations before, no Christian there. It's a Muslim country. It's Arab. It's a Muslim country. These days, you start seeing church in Arabs country. Why is that? God's promise. The good seed will grow and bring fruit. The bad seed will grow and bring fruit. If we just focus on the bad seed, yeah, the world grows darker. But if we also keep looking at the good seed, oh, we make terrible, oh, we make a, a, a great innovation, we make a great uh, things going on. With the internet, you know, it's easier to evangelize. And God brings fruit to them both. And I'm asking you to look at both sides. If you just keep looking on the bad side, the world is darker. There's no hope. But if you keep looking the good side, yes, there is some hope. And the point of this Christmas is this. I want to remind ourselves this Christmas that the only hope that we could get without any disappointment, Jesus the second coming of Christ. See, on Christmas, a lot of people try to sell you uh, false hope. There's hope in family. There's hope in friendship. There's hope in this. There's hope in that. There's hope in wealth. But I'm telling you, only Jesus give you a real one. Only Jesus can give you something that nobody can take away. Trying to convince my people. This is the only thing. God gave us something that cannot be taken away. Let that be our identity. If you put yourself. Your, for example I tell them. Your, what's your identity? I'm, I'm a husband. When your wife left you. When your wife died. You're not a husband anymore. 
What's your identity? I'm a mom. When your kid's not there, you're not a mom anymore. Your identity has been taken away. What your identity? I'm a CEO of a company. When you get retired, it's going to be taken away. But if you believe, what are you? I'm a children of God. I am God's people. God saved me because I belong to Him. Nobody take that away. And that hope that, that Jesus gave on my second coming, this is how we're going to go. When we hang that hope in there, all of a sudden, we leave this world. It's not that bad after all. When we face all the struggle, all the troubles, when we face uh, hardship, we keep saying, yeah, it hurts right now, but when Jesus is coming back, it's not going to be hurt like this. We keep connecting to the future. We keep, we keep putting our hope to the future. And that what makes us strong. And that is what makes us wait for Him eagerly. I'm not planning to say this, but I have done a little bit uh, thinking regarding the text. There's a text that's bothering me. There's one time that Jesus was asked by the Pharisee, Hey, uh, Jesus, you know, John the Baptist's uh, disciples, they go fasting. Our disciples, the Pharisees, we go fasting. How come we never see your disciple fasting? And Jesus answered with this. How can uh, 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 a bride of a groom fasting when the groom is there? And Jesus said, there will be a day when the groom is taken, and that's when they're going to fast. Jesus is saying that, you know why my disciples are not fasting? Because I'm here. I am their joy. But when I'm taken away, they will fast. And I'm wondering, you know, we're living in the, in the world where Jesus described. There's no Jesus. Right? And I was wondering, uh, when I ask the people in the church or people seasoned Christian, uh, you know, most of them, they fast. Hey, what are you fasting on? Uh, uh, I'm fasting because of this, because of that. I never hear them. I'm fasting because I miss Jesus so much. While the Bible said, when I'm taken away, people are going to mourn. People are going to fast. I don't know what God wants to do with this, but I'm telling you this. Jesus come only to get those who wait for Him eagerly. If you're not waiting for Him eagerly, that shows that your heart is connected with all the things in the world. And when your heart's connected with all the things in the world, all of a sudden heaven doesn't look like heaven anymore. Because your heart is connected to the things in the world. If you let go of all the things in the world connected to Jesus, all of a sudden heaven is heaven. Because Jesus is there. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for, for your grace. Father, um, <clears throat> I pray that you use this as something to encourage our heart. I feel my heart felt want to pray for those who's been in pain. Father, some people in here have dealt with pain. Some people in here have dealt with death. Some people in here have dealt with crime. I'm asking your grace come upon your people. I'm asking Holy Spirit you give an encouragement. Supernaturally, God. And I pray that you allow us to hang our hope on you. To put our identity on you. I pray, Lord Jesus. <clears throat> That you want to bless your church. I pray Lord Jesus that you let us grow. And bring good fruit for your kingdom. I pray your protection come upon us oh God. And I pray that you let our heart connected to you. And you alone. 
And on this Christmas, I pray that you remind us on your second coming, Lord God. I pray that that's when we put our hope on. I pray for your people in here, God. <clears throat> those who's in, who's in pain, those who's in sickness, those who face terrible pain, relationally. I pray, Lord God, that you want to heal us. I pray, Lord Jesus, that it will bring love into our heart. Thank you. Thank you so much, Father. We give everything into your hand. I'm asking your blessing come upon us and let your word bring fruit in our life, the fruit that you'll enjoy, the fruit that you'll like. And let us fill with joy this Christmas because you are our hope and you are never a disappointment. Thank you so much, Father. Thank you, God. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.